Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have together. Lord God, it is a season to, to be able to celebrate, Lord, you in a way that we've never been able to do it before, Lord God. Lord God, to be able to celebrate as we are sharing ourselves, not only with our, our ministry locally, but also with our, our ministry over there in Kenya. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God. I have all the ears open and ready to hear and, and uh, keep it in our hearts what is learned today. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. First of all, uh, Merry Christmas. I, uh, Christmas is one of my favorite times of the year, and it's always been my favorite time of the year. And now I did a little study on Christmas, and, you know, it kind of frustrated me a bit. So I'm going to share with you the things that I've studied about Christmas. Now, it's not all bad, but it's not all good either. We all know that Christmas is about the birth of Jesus, the Christ. But how did it become Santa, reindeer, and Frosty the snowman? See, as a Christian, I love celebrating Christmas. But in my country, you know, we do have Santa. We don't have Frosty. We don't have the reindeers. We, we do have Santa. And forget the elves. I mean, I, I didn't even look up anything about the elves. How did we get elves in there? You know, so I, I, I found some things out, and I'm going to share it with you. Is Christmas really the day Jesus was born? In the early years of Christianity, Easter was the main holiday. The birth of Jesus was not celebrated. In the fourth century, church officials decided to institute the birth of Jesus as a holiday. Unfortunately, the Bible does not mention date for his birth. A fact, Puritans later pointed out in order to, to deny the leg uh, legitimacy of the celebration. Although some evidence suggests that his birth may have occurred in the spring, why would shepherd be hurting in the middle of winter? Pope Julius I chose December 25th. It is commonly believed that the church chose this date to adopt the, and absorb the tradition of the pagan Saturnale festival, first called the Feast of Nativity. The custom spread to Egypt by 432 and to England by the end of the 6th century. Now, the whole idea of Christmas turned out to be that the Catholic Church made this day and it made it so the pagans will no longer celebrate their day that they were celebrating on december 25th now this day was a day after uh, the god of saturn so it started as a pagan holiday it's been a pagan holiday for thousands of years it's been a, a pagan holiday so the Catholic Church made it into a Christian holiday so they can get more people to turn to Catholicism. All right, I told you, you might not like it. All right, celebrating Christmas began with Christianity co-opt pagan celebration of the winter solstice in order to make Christianity more popular. The, the concept of Santa was created out of a combination of older Norse and Germanic uh, mythology. Reindeer were introduced as part of a children's story that was published in the 19th century. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was the result of a savvy advertisement campaign in the 1920s. So I looked it up. Santa actually was someone from Turkey. So I guess we can have lots of turkey for Christmas. But it's not the animal turkey, but the, uh, the country turkey. So I have not seen a Turkish Santa. How about you? And how in the world did they put him in his sleeping gown? Because maybe you don't notice that Santa is in his pajamas. Anyone noticed? <laughs> So how did he become a fat man that has to climb into the chimney? There are lots of questions that we can ask, but a lot of Christmas that we celebrate today has been due to commercials. Now, the big fat Santa with the jolly cheeks and uh, holding a Coca-Cola is how we got this picture. 
Koch did it. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was for an advertisement. It became part of Christmas tradition just because of being an advertisement. But we also know Frosty the Snowman. So let's go and pay him some attention. During the Christmas season of 1950, a new holiday song was introduced that told the tale of an inanimate snowman that came to life to spread good cheer. Written by Steve Nelson and Jack Rollins, Frosty the Snowman became an international hit uh, recording and, and a permanent part of many people's Christmas celebration. Now, if the person that wrote this, Steve Nelson and Jack Rollins, were to get royalties for every single snowman that is placed for Christmas, they today would be billionaires. How come it is so easy to change Christmas? Because these people were able to change Christmas from being a, a day that we're celebrating the birth of Christ. Yes, it was pagan. That's how it started. Yeah, but y'all notice it's becoming pagan again. What was so different about the pagan holidays? It was a carnival. Now, some of you don't know what carnival is unless you see the movie Rio. You watch Rio and it's like, oh, that's a carnival. Well, that's really uh, the nice part of the carnival. You want to see a carnival? You got to go to Latin America. We have carnivals. We have them once a year. We set up all these big elaborate uh, uh, um, themes. And the women uh, come in and they're going to wear lots of feathers and a little bit of clothes. If you go to Brazil, you're going to see it. As they're preparing, the mom is like, well, I have my daughter uh, being in the carnival today because I'm hoping that she'll find a husband. <laughs> it's like, what? She's going to find a husband? Yeah, because she's going to wear a little or nothing and going to be up there on, on, on some platform and shaking it and trying to get somebody's attention for it. Uh, and every year in Rio, they have a competition of who is going to be like the queen of the carnival. And it's a big deal. This is how Christmas started, as a pagan holiday that was a carnival. People would come and they would lose their minds on this day. Now, it was a mixture of different uh, beliefs that came together from uh, the Nordic belief and that's how we got the ice and cold and all the other stuff. So why do we celebrate Christmas? Because we have all these pagan things in our church for Christmas. We do. I started with that first thing with where it says Merry Christmas, and it had uh, a little piece of, uh, of uh, pine uh, needles and some, uh, I forgot what kind of those seeds are, but if you eat them, they're poisonous. You know, we have the reefs, and we have the Christmas trees. We, we're still carrying these pagan symbols, uh, and we're celebrating Christmas for it. So what have we done is, I believe, here at church, We've taken the good things out of it and left out the bad things because we share gifts with people. St. Nicholas was, uh, was a, a bishop in, uh, in Turkey, and he's who uh, Santa Claus is supposed to be, and he would give toys to the kids. And that's how he became St. Nicholas, later on Santa Claus. So today I want you to read the actual story of Jesus' birth. Now, it was called the Nativity. Before it was called Christmas, it was called the Nativity. I think that's more appropriate, don't you think? Because we're celebrating the time when Jesus was born. And it came to pass in those days that a, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This census first took place while uh, Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Now, do you understand what's going on? They had to be taxed. Now, for you to be taxed, you're being counted. So for you to be counted, you had to be back home. So here, Joseph had to be back home. And back home was in Bethlehem. So he went to be taxed in Bethlehem. Do understand Joseph and Mary had no plans of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. 
They had no plans of it. You know, it's like bad timing. She's pregnant. We got to go to Bethlehem now. How are you going to go to Bethlehem? You're like about to give birth anytime. No preparation, no forethought. Here we go to Bethlehem. We're going to go to Bethlehem. We're going to figure out when we get over there because, you know, we don't have Google. We don't have phone. We don't have text. We don't have email. We don't, none of that stuff existed. None of it. We didn't have cars then. So they go off to Bethlehem. And when they get to Bethlehem, no one was there waiting for them. They're from that city, but where's their family? How come they didn't go to their family place? So they went over there just to, to do one simple thing. We're going to go get registered. That's all we're going to do. We're going to go get registered, and then we're going to go back home. You got the plan, right? They're going to go get registered, and then they're going to go back home. Got it. All right. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. Now, do understand this. Joseph is of the lineage of King David. King David's hometown here is Bethlehem. Everybody that lives in Bethlehem is related to King David. One person becomes a whole entire city. All right, so he's going to go to the city of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. All right, we have drama, y'all. This is drama. This is drama unlike you've ever seen because unlike today, you can have a pregnant teenager and no one even looks twice. No one looks at the girls like, oh, that poor girl, man. She's around the wrong people. None of them are, nobody's doing that. At this time, if you got pregnant and you were a teenager, you're most likely going to die. Y'all got that, right? And you know who's going to kill you? Your parents. You know how they killed you? How? How did they stone you? All right, they built, they built a hole. They dug a hole, y'all. They're going to bury you in the hole. And only your head is going to be sticking out. And then they're going to throw stones at you. Any takers? This was not a good time to get pregnant and not be married. This was a really inopportune time to get pregnant and see, so she's engaged. Now, engagement back then was as solid as being married already. It's not like us, that we can get engaged and it's like, okay, we're, gonna, uh, we're just going to break it off the engagement. No, you actually had to get a divorce. You had to divorce someone when you were engaged to them. Because you already are into a lawful union. You just haven't finished the, the, to the last step. You are going to be married and you already have uh, certain documentation that shows that you are engaged. So Joseph realized she was pregnant. And Joseph didn't want her to get killed. And Joseph thought to himself, you know what? I'm going to put her away privately. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divorce her, send her back home. I'm not going to make a big deal about it. Nobody's going to ever know that it ever happened because I know that baby is not my baby, and I know she's pregnant. Wait, we don't talk about Christmas like this. We don't talk about the drama that happened in Christmas where the guy is like having to think of, I can't believe she cheated on me. I thought she was a good woman. I thought, you know, she was better, better than most. And here I come find out she's been fooling around with somebody else the whole time. And here is a uh, uh, Mary. Mary's already showing, but Mary's not trying to explain it to him. Isn't that wild? She's not like, oh, yes, Joseph, this was by the Holy Spirit. She didn't do that. She just kept her to herself. She probably was praying, Lord God, please don't let him notice. <laughs> Don't let me show. Yeah, so, but he noticed, and he was going to put her away. And when he planned to put her away, he had a dream. 
And in the dream, God told them that that was from the Holy Spirit, that she was going to have the Messiah, and that was from the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you. I may not have believed it. Because this is some drama, y'all. Okay? How many of you who are married would have believed that right away? Your girlfriend is pregnant. It's from the Holy Spirit. I want to believe it. <laughs> Thank God he did. All right. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Huh. We just had a, a little baby born a little while ago. And, and it, it went something like this. The baby is coming today. No, the baby is not. The baby is for sure coming today. No, the baby is not. Well, sometime this week, this baby is going to come. No, it did not. <laughs> the thing about babies is they get here when they want to get here, right? Unless we make an appointment. They couldn't do that before. They can make the appointment before. But that day came. The day came for that baby to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there were no room for them in the inn. Oh, it sounds so pretty. So let's go over it. All right, she's giving birth. And there's no place for her to give birth in. There's no place. I'm sorry, we're full. We're full. I'm sorry, honey. What would you come over here pregnant for? We're full. She was a teenager. Can you imagine how many people were looking at her like, you need to make better plans. Come on now. It's too early for you to be getting pregnant like this. It is full. We're full. We're full. There were no rooms. There were no rooms anywhere. So we have it traditionally that they went into a barn. Well, most likely they went to, into a cave where they kept the animals. Most likely that's where they were, a place where the animals can stay in. I have animals. I have animals, y'all. I have animals. One thing I know about animals I won't want my baby to be born in the same place where the animals are. I won't want that. Yeah, I, hey, I don't mind the ba. I, I don't mind that. That's kind of cute. You know, I, I don't mind the, the sounds that they make. It's that animals have poop everywhere. Poop everywhere. We recently bought a dog, a Great Pyrenees. And it said on air that Great Pyrenees are, are dogs to be kept outside. You got it, right? They are outside dogs. They're not inside dogs. They're outside dogs. Well, the Great Pyrenees are white dogs, so I didn't want my dog outside because it's going to get dirty. I wanted my dog inside. So I tried house training my dog. There's a reason why they said it's a how outside dog. Because outside it would sniff all over the place until it finds a good spot where it wants to relieve itself and it will relieve itself there. But inside the house, anywhere, it's okay. There's no smelling and sniffing and trying to figure it out. It's like, oh, you brought me inside. Bathroom. And I'm looking at the dog like, no, not bathroom. This is not outside bathroom. He said, outside, beautiful. Bathroom. This is bathroom outside. Gorgeous, green, fresh air, wind blowing on you inside. Bathroom, cold floor tile bathroom. We could not get on the same uh, page, so she won. She's outside. Last night, got down in the 20s, saw her this morning. She's all happy. Nothing like the outdoors. Great Pyrenees, like it outside. I could not imagine the Great Pyrenees inside a cave with baby Jesus. Because that dog would be bathroom bathroom everywhere bathroom bathroom everywhere then the goats 
You've never had goats. I'm sure you didn't. You can be looking at the goat and at the same time they're looking at you. Don't stand still. And they're pooping at the same time. I mean, it's just falling. <laughs> they're very stoic. They sit there and it's like, we're going to stare. We're going to have a stare com competition. But they're pooping. It's like, I mean, it's just like a waterfall just going on behind them. Baby Jesus being born in a place like that. Which mom would like to have their baby under those conditions? See, we forget because it looks so pretty after many years and so far removed how bad it would be if it was you. When she wrapped them up with swaddling clothes and laid them in the manger, that sounds so beautiful. I mean, it sounds so poetic. It really does until you find out what swaddling clothes are because it's not clothes. She wrapped them up with rags. A manger sounds beautiful, except that's where you feed the animals. Could you imagine how many animals went up to Jesus and it's like, he doesn't smell like food. Why is he where my food goes? Where are you going to put my food from now on? If you're putting that baby there. <laughs> so it makes it sound so pretty. Now, Jesus being Lord of all could have been born somewhere else. He could have been born in, in some castle somewhere. He could have been born with, you know, all the potentates know who he is the moment he, he was born. He could have had the, the best of the best all his life because he's the king of glory. But instead, he was born, born so lowly just so we can reach him. That's the only reason Jesus was born so lowly. So he is reachable. He's touchable, tangible. See, if he was born in a, in a castle somewhere, only those who are rich and have authority could reach him. But he did it in such a way that everybody can get to know him. I watched a, uh, a documentary many years ago about Korea. And in Korea, when they had the rice paddy, and uh, the women were really, really pregnant, and, and, and then sometimes they were out there in the field all by themselves, and their water will break, and they will start going into labor, and they'll have that baby, and they'll clean that baby up, and they'll strap the baby on themselves, and then keep on working. See, Jesus was born so lowly that even though they are born lowly, they can touch him. They can reach him. He's reachable. Some of us, we come to church, and it's, it's more of a tradition, and I've, I see this more so in Alabama than anywhere else because we're not involved in what we say we are. See, it's so sad that if someone had to live with you and they weren't Christian, I wonder if they, they would say that you, you are a Christian. Because the only time we show that we have any faith is when we come to church on Sundays. If we were, someone were to walk in right now and they had an M16 and it said, if you're a Christian, I'm going to kill you. I think a lot of us will survive. Because our commitment is not fully. Our commitment is shallow. Because if you have a commitment that is full, you want to share. See, I've seen people that are in love. Have you ever seen people that are in love? I've seen people that are in love. They'll show up, this is my boyfriend, and they're all so excited about that. But this is my boyfriend. You're looking at the boyfriend, and it's like, if that were you, I wouldn't be saying that. Whew. That boy needs some work. But they don't know it because they're in love. They're having there telling everybody, everybody, this is my boyfriend, this is my boyfriend, this is my boyfriend, this is my boyfriend. We got some Christians that never share about Christ. So therefore, you don't have that kind of love. You don't have that kind of commitment. Because you never share with anybody. You have a private relationship. 
We have a word for private relationships. It's not a nice word. I don't even know if I should say it. <laughs> I have some shaking ahead. Don't say it. Don't say it. But it starts with a B and it's a call. Did you get it? It's the booty call. Y'all made me have to say it. The private relationship will be the booty call. Because nobody knows you're having a relationship. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Just a phone call in the middle of the night. Can I come over? That's it. Some of us have. That's our Christian experience. Well, can I come over? Nobody knows that you're a Christian. You're an, you're an undercover brother. Nobody knows. Why? You never share. Why don't you ever share? Well, because that's the level of love you have. Because if you're more in love, then you want to share it with everybody. You want everybody to know. Everybody knows. It's amazing. I went uh, this past Friday. We had a substitute teacher. And the substitute teacher was, came, uh, was right next to my room. And he came to introduce himself to me. But I already knew him. I ran into him before, many years ago. He's a pastor. And I'm like, oh, I know who you are. He looked at me all puzzled. How do you know who I am? Because he's looking at my name. You know, and then that, that DR in front of my name really messes people up because they forget they, they've known me. All of a sudden, it's like they, they get stuck in titles. And I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, we know each other. Oh! Oh, you but oh <laughs> he's a pastor and i'm like okay why are you substituting oh give me something to do during the daytime i thought to myself man i wish i had that kind of life did i need something to do i don't have that's not the kind of life i have but he's a pastor so i know him as a pastor what about if he came to the school and he was acting all weird and on pastory i already know him So right now, right now, show of hands. Show of hands. How many people in here, everybody knows that you're a Christian? Raise your hand. Everybody. Okay, put your hand back down. So if I should ask people around you, would they say you're a Christian? Would they, is that, well, that would be their answer? Yes. He's definitely a Christian. See, Jesus came and was born in such a lowly way so you can reach him. But you have to reach him. You have to. You have to make a commitment with Christ. You have to. Saying you're a Christian, I want you to know in the United States, everybody says they're Christians. Everybody says they're Christians. But here is how the Bible distinguishes who is a Christian and who isn't a Christian. It's by the simple way of saying, you know them by their fruit. If you have no fruit, we don't know what kind of tree you are. You might just be a flowering tree. But the word of God doesn't say, you know them by their flowers. You know them by their fruit. And Jesus said, I want you to bear fruit, and I want you to bear fruit more abundantly. I don't want you to be a tree that has two fruit on it. I remember when I went to Panama, and we went to, to, uh, um, to um, Cerro Azul. Now, some of us have been there. Yeah, we've been there. We went, first time we went to Cerro Azul, it didn't have houses. It was just the land. And there we walked up the hill, and there was one miniature mango tree. I was a kid, so it was a little. So I can't give you a true estimate of what it looked like because being that I was that big, the tree to me seemed like that big. 
and that tree had four mangoes on it. Four. It was a miniature mango tree with gigantic mangoes. The mangoes were like this big. And I'm like, how in the world does that little tree have four mangoes? And the guy is like, don't touch the mangoes. Why not? Because the moment you take one off, it's going to be off kilter. It has the four mangoes, so it's going to stay balanced. You take one off on this side, all of a sudden it's like, because the mangoes are so big. Humongous mangoes. Now, you know what? I know what kind of tree that was. You didn't have to tell me. I didn't have to take a class. I'm figuring out what tree that was. I may not know the leaves. I may not know the bark. I may not know the width and the girth of the tree. But there's one thing I knew. That's a mango. Considering that tree was so small, that tree was abundant. Because the fruit were huge. So for some of you who you're shorter than others, that's not no excuse for having no fruit. You may be able to have bigger fruit than other people. But the reality is, we must have fruit. So what does scripture say we should do with the tree? Not we, because I have nothing to do with it. This is God. What happened with the tree with no fruit? Cut and do what with it? Yeah, it'll be firewood. It'll be good for firewood. It'll be good for something. It'll be good for firewood. We come to church and we think it's okay to have no fruit. I've just been coming here for years. Where's your fruit? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. What kind of tree are you? Uh, I don't know. Is this not a good ground? Maybe it's the ground. Maybe it's the church that's causing you not to grow. Maybe it's your surroundings. But we are supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be moving on. We're supposed to be getting better. I started this morning where we're talking about music and saying how music, we're supposed to be progressively getting better. But we're supposed to be progressively getting better as Christians. See, we have some Christians that sit down and when we start the message, they fall asleep. They're the sleepy Christians. I think maybe I should do a study on the seven doors and find out if we have some of those at church. Because I know we got sleepy. I know we got grumpy. I, <laughs> I, I know we got those two. <laughs> uh, I, we got sneezy too. I know we got that one. Because you know, one of my kids, when he starts to sneeze, he don't stop. It's just over and over and over, one after the other, you know. So uh, <laughs> we we got we got three, you know. Maybe if I keep going, I'm, I might find the other ones. But we have them in church, where church is the best time to sleep. You come to church, and then, and then we get the excuses. Oh, I I didn't sleep last night. Well, guess what? Pastor didn't sleep last night either. <laughs> but I had to get up and do the PowerPoint for today, and have to do the message for today. And yes, I have a full-time job. And yes, I'm still going to school full-time. And yesterday, I drove all the way to Atlanta and back. <laughs> Got here last night. Yes, our lives are full. But I don't have an excuse. How about if I gave one to you? Would you like it? Honey, how about if we gave an excuse? There'll be no message today, y'all. I got in last night. Yeah, we're going we gonna to watch Thor. You're going to watch the new Avatar that just came out. That's what we're going to do. We gonna watch. We'll, hey, you know what? We'll probably get a lot of people to show up then. And we probably won't have anybody fall asleep. 
So if we're supposed to have fruit, we're about to finish this year. We're about to finish 2022. How many here this year can say I bore fruit this year? Well, Brittany bore fruit in, in a lot of different ways. She got a new baby, so I, I can't argue about that. We have uh, Danai back there. She raised her hand. She said she, she bore some fruit. Okay. All right, so we got some people trying to figure it out. All right, so how many of you who bro bore fruit? Does your fruit make a difference for somebody else? Ooh, one hand. Two, your fruit is going to be beneficial for somebody else. All right, now, you know we should have 100%. We should have everybody's hand. Hey, I bore fruit in 2022, and my fruit is beneficial for somebody else. Everybody should have raised their hand. We're about to go into a new year. Let's not repeat 2022 if we didn't do anything that's useful for somebody else. Because Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for us. Now what we do is that we live in service of what he gave us. So my life is not my own. The Bible says this. My life, your life is not your own. You save, you've been bought. Someone paid your cost. You're not your own. In other words, you don't get to do what you want to do. You don't get to go where you want to go. You don't get to say what you want to say. You don't get to hang around the people you want to hang around with. You get to do what God asks you to do. You get to be around the people that God wants you to be around. This morning I was sharing that I invited three people to our uh, last function and uh, two acted equitably. One didn't respond at all. Pretend it never happened. See, but the one that I re re responded didn't respond at all two weeks before asked me to play for her, her function and I went and played for their function. It should be almost like, hey, I did something for you. Your turn. The other two that showed up that I didn't do anything for them. <laughs> One wrote me a nice check. Not for me. If it was for me, I'll be happier. It wasn't for me. It was for us. Wrote a really nice check for the ministry. I mean, really, really nice. It was more than what everybody gave. She exceeded everybody's giving just with one single check. And she said, I'm sorry I couldn't make it. Here's my support. And I'm thinking, Lord God, send me that member to our church regularly. She don't call me what the other teachers call me. She calls me brother. Every time she say, come here, my brother. Come here, brother. It's so weird that the other students will look at her like, how oh, he could be your brother. You're white. He's black. Hey, my brother, come on over here. I need to talk to your second brother. They're like, why is she calling you brother? I said, because I'm, uh, she's my sister. <laughs> Didn't you come from another country? Yeah, but our father supersedes that. What do you mean your father supersedes that? Your, your father is like, uh, your father is white and black and what? I don't understand. She is my sister in Christ. We're related by the blood of Jesus. We're closer than brothers and sisters. When we get to heaven, we're still brothers we still are oh 
They're saying, oh, but they don't understand. <laughs> they don't understand. They're middle schoolers. It's okay. They don't understand. Now imagine, I didn't ask her for money. What should have happened if I asked her for money? I think she probably would have given more. Because do remember, she calls me brother. That's how they know me. Your sister was calling you. Oh, okay, I'm going to email her and see what she needs. <laughs> they understand. Those that are Christian understand why she calls me brother. Those who are Christian understand why I call her sister. See, I want you to know that we're supposed to make such a difference that this was the complaint that was said to me this past Thursday. Here's the complaint now. All right, here's the complaint. We're in middle school. Wednesday, we have a uh, Bible uh, club comes together every Wednesday in the morning. So Wednesday in the morning, they are all going in the room for Bible club. And there's about 200 of them show up. 200 kids every Wednesday. This was the teacher on Thursday. I don't know why they're going in there. They're cursing on the way going in there. And I'm thinking to myself, you're a grown up. Why are you pulling, uh, pulling down all these young kids? Everybody has those days. Everybody makes mistakes. Sorry, be caught in Miley Cyrus in church. That was that was something that I said before Miley Cyrus decided to put it in a song. I just, I think she needs to pay me royalties. <laughs> we can't judge these little kids like this. They're kids. We don't expect them to have it perfect yet. But mind mind this. How come the adults don't have it yet? How come the adults still don't have the Christian stuff together? We want the kids to get it, but why are the adults not getting it? Why are we not acting like a Christian, but saying we're a Christian by our mouth? It is your actions that count. Your mouth can talk, but if your actions contradict what your mouth says, you're not what you say you are. Again, we all make mistakes. We all fall. We all miss the mark. And I'm grateful that God is gracious and he'll forgive us. But we have to remember, there are people that are looking at us. Kids, there are adults that are looking at you and you say you're Christian and they're like, yeah, that's not Christian. That's, that's not Christian. You can be stopping an adult from giving their life to Christ because you're Speech says you're one thing, but your action says you're something else. I have one young lady, she's in school with me every day. Every day she sees me. And if one day she sees me doing something that I shouldn't do as a Christian, I hope she has the courage to ask me, why did you do that? Because I strive to show kindness to everybody. I strive See, my class is a weird class because all my kids, except one, want to be in my class. You don't understand. It's like this. You walk by, are you taking me out of my class today? Are you taking me out? Are you taking me out of my class? Please take me out of my class. Please take me out. Please take me out. I'll go in there and say, let me have these two. Can I go too, please? And then I have kids who English is their only language. They're African-American or Caucasian. Can I go too, please? I'm like, <laughs> I can't take you. My class is racist. I can't take you to my class. <laughs> no, it, my class is not really racist, okay? <laughs> my class is for all those people who are learning how to speak English. So they're not African American or Caucasian. Okay, so we got that, right? We understand that. That's my class. Yeah, so oh, this particular student on, on Thursday, she said, please take me out. She, she attends here with us. Please take me out of the class. Please take me out. Please take me out. On Friday, I said, I'm going to clean my room. I'll volunteer to clean your room. I'll stay the whole day and clean your room the whole entire day. Can you pull me out and just have me clean your room? And, and, and you just tell the teachers, I'm in your room cleaning your room. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, Why? Why do the kids want to hang around me? One truth. I give them candy every class. 
every class they get candy. They have to earn it. It's going to be the best person in the class gets a candy every class, every day. Oh, well, I want to be in your class too. Then I look around for the candy that they ate in their home country. So I will come with Colombian candy, Mexican candy. I haven't been able to find Cuban candy, but I, they eat a lot of the Col Colombian candy, so that works. You know, and then I get chips. And then I throw parties. I do pizza parties. And then I invite their former teachers to come and show up, the former uh, language uh, teachers. So if they came from the lower school, their teacher would show up. If they had the higher school last year, that's where she's at in high school, I'll invite her and she shows up. And they're all excited. What am I doing? I'm drawing them. Come on now. We're supposed to be fisher of men. I'm fishing. Fish don't like candy. I've tried it. I put some bubblicious on my, on, the, on my hook and threw it in there and all the fish just ignored it, but people like it. <laughs> and I go fishing for people. And I, I can't minister to them like I minister to you here, but I can show them the love of Christ. I can listen to their complaint, and sometimes their complaint is like really, 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 really down there. She don't like me. Why doesn't she like you? She don't like Mexicans. She don't like any of the Mexicans. Why you feel that way? Well, because of this and because of the other and because of the next. And then, okay, do you want me to talk to her? No, I don't want you because then she's going to treat me worse. Okay, you don't want me to talk to her. So do you just want me to listen to you? Yes, just, yeah, I just need you to just listen. Just need. That was very easy. I'll do a thing, y'all. And sometimes I might not be listening, really. I might be thinking of something I have to do after class, but they don't need to know that. They just want someone to hear. So what am I doing? I'm being an ear to somebody. Some of you in here, you live a really stingy life. It's all about you. Everything revolves around you and Amazon. <laughs> I have a poster as you walk into my room. It's for me. It's, it's a poster is for me. Uh, you know, it's, I gave it to my wife. She still has it on her, the front of her car. She, she planned to put it on her wall sometime. Okay, it hasn't happened yet, but it, it says this. Most people will get to touch a thousand people in their whole lifetime. Most people will touch a thousand people in the whole lifetime. But a teacher can touch 10,000 people in a lifetime. We can touch a lot more people. So I'm gonna touch people with my daily walk. I had to give a test this past week and one of the questions on the test, the very last question on the test is this. Have you have anyone that has made a difference in your life, whether now or even in history? Who is that person and what have they done? And the majority of my students said mom. Their mom is the person that has made the difference in their life. The majority said that. One kid said it was me. I had to try my best to suck up those tears because I am grading him while he's talking because he's speaking. And he said, the person that has made a difference in my life is Dr. White because he's taught me that only 2% of Latinos get to go to college. And he's told me I'm able to go if I really want to. And he's told me I'm smarter than what I think. And I'm the smartest one in the room. And he's already made a difference in my life. Ooh, trying to suck up the tears right now. Well, why? It's only been a half a school year. 
If I made a difference in a half of a school year, how much difference can I make in a year? If I can make a difference in a half a school year, how about you? How much difference can you make? I want you to live this from this Christmas on Chris, Christmas. Can't even talk right now. From this Christmas on, I want you to live with a purpose of I'm trying to reach somebody. For 16 years in this church, I've been trying for our members to branch out from here. The whole purpose of you getting saved is not to get saved to keep the salvation to yourself, but is to share with someone else. And if you're failing to share with someone else, you're failing to show the love that has been shown to you. For Jesus didn't just die lowly. I mean, he didn't, didn't live lowly, but he also died lowly. For us to be able to make a difference for others. Would you please pray with me? Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to be able to reach to others, Lord God. Lord God, in other generations, you've had many missionaries to come from this country and have died in other countries trying to reach people. Lord God, and it's how we have fallen so far behind that, Lord God, that all those that have gone before us seem to have faded into history. Lord God, that we can have that fervency again, that no matter the cost, we're going to chase hard after you and we're going to win souls for you. No matter what the cost, Lord God, even if we should have to lay down our own lives, for you allowed your son to lay down his life for us. And the least that we can do is lay down our lives for him. Father, let us have a heart to win souls. For you said in your word that he that wins souls is wise. Let us be able to go down every road and make sure, and make certain that everyone has had an opportunity to be able to hear that they are loved by you. Lord God, bless your, the, those who are hearing. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.